Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Out of Spec podcast, your go-to source for all things electric vehicles. I'm Francie, and joining me today is Max, which is apt because not only, Max, are you, of course, a member of the Out of Spec team, but you're also a Polestar 2 owner, and this is important because we're going to talk about a pretty significant and potentially very exciting announcement and development in the world of electric vehicle charging, wherein Polestar and StoreDot successfully demonstrated extreme fast charging, or what they're calling XFC technology, charging a Polestar 5 prototype from 10 to 80% state of charge in just 10 minutes. Let's plug in. This episode is made possible by the support we get from Fort Collins Kia. If you are in the market for any electric Kia, not only do they never add market adjustments, they will deliver your car to you anywhere in the 48 contiguous states for out-of-spec viewers. More information in the link in the show notes. Okay, Max, so let's start with this press release. But first off, thanks for coming on to the podcast. You're a Polestar 2 owner. We're going to go over all of the details of this story and dive into it. And of course, the larger implications. But you're also kind of going to break down the technical speak that we have in here because there's different units thrown around when there's this new innovation with charging, you know, the way that automakers communicate, like how fast this is happening and trying to really communicate like how much range or the amount of power that you're getting in your EV over a short amount of time. I don't know. There's a couple different interpretations for it. So you're going to help us clear that up too. Happy to help here. And I will say, you know, I drive the Polestar 2. I actually drove the launch model year because I bought it used. I love balling on a budget. But I will note that, like, my car is an interesting example of the trend in general with EVs where batteries really are the beating heart of these machines. I mean, people might think, oh, it's like a gas car. It's going to be the motor or the engine. And not to say the motor is a simple component in an electric car, but really when it comes to most of the experience people have with electric cars, from fast charging them to range and how they behave in cold weather, a lot of that is really dependent on the battery, how the battery is thermally managed, all of these like nerdy geekery details that can change the car a lot. So case in point, my car being the launch model year has an LG chem sourced 78 kilowatt hour battery that's like perfectly fine. Like it charges 10 to 80 percent in like 35 minutes, gets 200 miles of range. That's not because the battery's bad. It's just because the car is really not efficient, but it's a fun car. Uh, but the newer version of the car has a marginally larger battery sourced, I believe, by CATL, so different, slightly different chemistry. That battery charges a lot quicker and has been shown to have better behavior where like when you get to you know the scary kind of nail biting range of like 10 percent that battery won't throttle the performance as much whereas in my car the scary thing is if i get to a charger fancy and i'm at seven percent my car starts to behave more like a golf cart and actually severely restricts power to the motors that newer battery in the polestar 2 doesn't so that's just kind of an example i'm giving to show you that like batteries can really change the experience of a vehicle uh even if you don't change much else just the beating heart of that that battery um, is really going to determine a lot of what's going on. So that's why this store dot and, and like Polestar co-announcement they made is really exciting because it's tantalizing with what it brings to market. But can you fill us in a little bit more on like what it is? Yeah, that was a great context to add. Thank you, Max. And okay, so let's start with the press release itself so we can all get on the same page. So they wrote that the Fully drivable verification prototype, the Polestar 5, saw a consistent charge rate starting at 310 kilowatts and rising to a peak in excess of 370 kilowatts at the end of charging. Interesting. This world first demonstration, as they call it, of a 10 minute, 10 to 80% state of charge, extreme fast charge using silicon dominant cells in a drivable vehicle rather than individual cells in a laboratory environment, because we see that they test these in labs, but this is actually in a prototype drivable vehicle, is the continuation of Polestar's commitment to developing the best driving experience for the future through innovative technology partnerships. The, this specially commissioned 77 kilowatt hour battery pack, which has the potential to be increased to at least 100 kilowatt hours, could add 200 miles of range to a midsize electric car in 10 minutes. This XFC, like we said, they're calling this extreme fast charging technology. And this test by Polestar and StoreDot battery engineers was designed to demonstrate proof of concept for XFC battery technology that could be applied to future Polestar vehicles. 
Okay. So one thing that I'm definitely like cluing into here and that you kind of mentioned earlier, or maybe it was before we even got on the podcast, but if people have been staying tuned into Polestar News, Polestar was, it hasn't been its own independent brand really forever, right? But now they have a chance with, you know, funding that was pulled out from Volvo and, or, you know, it's being, they're giving the chance to stand on their own as an automaker. And then there's this announcement with really innovative technology. And we've got the Polestar 1, the Polestar 2, the Polestar 3 coming on the market. Now the Polestar 5, there's the Polestar 4. So we have all these different (laughs) things, but, uh, you know, all these different numbered Polestars. But okay, what are your first thoughts with all of those stats going on in this press release? It does seem pretty impressive. Yeah, well, let's put that all in the context. I do want to talk about maybe we can do that at the end of this podcast, the Polestar 5 and what that means for the brand, because I think that is really exciting from a product perspective. This is like their Halo product um, that they're bringing to market, and it's really exciting. But um, crucially, what you said earlier in the press release is really important. This is a demonstration that wasn't done on some battery cell in a laboratory cooled in mineral oil at like, you know, a tiny voltage because it's one cell. This was done at a full vehicle scale with a full vehicle size battery in a live test vehicle, not a production vehicle because they still have to finish this thing. But theoretically, this is a battery that I guess StoreDot and Polestar and Group 14 or whomever they may be sourcing the battery components from could build in the vehicle. Um, So that's really exciting because there's a huge difference between, uh, you know, what a lot of promising battery startups have promised promised people for 15 years and actually putting it into vehicles. And I don't want to trivialize this. I'm not saying they're all liars and frauds, but it's really, the, my point is it's really, really hard to take like uh, the discoveries that you make in a laboratory setting and these exciting flashy press releases and put them into a car. So this is among the closest we've seen to this, you know, really cool technology, which they have flashily branded as XFC. Uh, and they've, I think StoreDot, they're an Israeli, you know, battery startup. They seem to have a lot of cool, like brain talent, a lot of really interesting technology. Their big promise for several years now has been what they call 105. Uh, the idea that in five minutes at a fast charger on a road trip in an electric car, you could add 100 miles of range. Now, let me just first say, I take issue with adding miles per minute or miles an hour because it's going to vary so much vehicle to vehicle, especially for us here at Out of Spec, where we're more nerds, we're into the, you know, uh, the the uh, lower the level of things. It's a little frustrating because, fancy for context, like 100 miles of range in, let's say, my Polestar could be 40 miles of range in a Hummer EV, right? It's totally dependent on, like, the vehicle and a bunch of other situations. So instead, what I like more and what I think the industry industry uh, nomenclature typically is, is to say a state of charge within a certain time. That sounds very nerdy, but what that means is basically, let's uh, just dumb it down, right? 10% battery, let's say you arrive at the charger almost dead, you want to charge up to 80%. The reason you don't want to charge further is because typically there's diminishing returns past that point with most lithium ion batteries where they just slow down a lot. So in a road trip setting, you're living between 80 and 10%, or maybe if you're Kyle Connor and even narrower range where you're really trying to get like the peak charging speeds, the fastest possible charging you can do. Um, so 10 to 80% kind of like an industry benchmark. I think uh, some of the other leaders in this space with production cars, like Hyundai Motor Group with vehicles like the Ionic 5, the Ionic 6, the Kia EV6, so many great cars, those all do 10 to 80% on like an 80 kilowatt hour roughly battery in around 18 to 20 minutes, which is really impressive. Uh, And then Porsche, also has a high voltage battery in the Taycan, the new version of that can do 10 to 80% in uh, I think 18 minutes too. So which may sound like, oh, no more impressive. It is because it's actually a larger battery. So 10 to 80% is more capacity. So going back here to the context of what StoreDot and Polestar are doing, they're, I think, test one, right? It's a 77 kilowatt hour battery, which they say they could expand to 100 kilowatt hours. So right now, already in the market, a Porsche Taycan will do that with a 105 kilowatt hour gross battery pack. They've only demonstrated this with a 77 kilowatt hour pack, but they did it not in 18 minutes, they've done it in 10 minutes, which is really cool. And they provided a brief like two minute video, I think we can link it in the description of how this process worked, but like this was not a laboratory experiment, I mean it was, but like it was real world conditions. They said no exotic cooling was going on, all the margins, all the temperatures were within safe limits, so this was like theoretically achievable is what they were demonstrating. Uh, And that's really cool. And so maybe we can talk a little bit more. uh, People are curious about like 
what the challenge of fast charging is, but the fact that they've done it, this landmark, and just breaking down the PR speak, the miles an hour, which I hate, until like, you know, the, the battery percentage, which thankfully they've also provided. It's exciting. It's cool. It's not, if you break it down, maybe as revolutionary as they might make it seem, considering it's not a huge battery, but if they can expand it, if they can mass produce it, this is really cool. Definitely. And the words charging anxiety and the concept of charging anxiety definitely comes to mind. And it is addressed in their press release as well. And we know this to be a real thing. People don't want to be stuck plugged in at an EV charging station for 30 minutes to an hour, which is kind of the average time most people face for a 10 to 80% charge and would yeah. rather be getting on their way. So the inkling that we could have that kind of charge in 10 minutes, 18 minutes with the Porsche, but also there's that price point. Can we bring it down to a more affordable version of EVs You know, for everyone to be able to take advantage of DC fast charging when they're on road trips, when they're on the go? Because mostly, hopefully, you're slow charging your EV, but that if you are at a charger, or like you know, all the stuff with the Lyft drivers, with rental cars, with Uber drivers, to kind of help that move along to have shorter stints at EV charging stations. I think. Yeah, quick rant. I want to say, Francie, actually, a lot of our audience I know and a lot of EV nerds will say, like, if you don't have home charging or if you don't live, if you live in an apartment, you don't live in a house, don't buy an EV because you shouldn't. And I, I get that sentiment because like AC charging, charging, you know, off the wall, off the power grid uh, with non-exotic charging is definitely cheaper. It can be more reliable. Um, you know, there's a lot of benefits to it. Not everyone can do it. And the, if we're going to live in a future where a lot of people drive electric vehicles, some people, for better or worse, are going to have to live in an environment where they're basically, it's like going to the gas station. Every week, they've got to go to that charger and charge up. And it doesn't have to be as bad as it sounds. My mom got her Rivian R1S recently. She loves it. Uh, and they have a slow home charger, but she's noticed, you know, let's say they didn't have that every day. She loses 7% of battery. She could go with that thing for like 12, 13 days without charging it and be totally fine. Uh, and that's just a normal average 20 mile urban commute she has. So just to put it in the context, some people will have to live a lifestyle of relying on these fast chargers. And so it not, might not always even be in a road trip situation. So the more convenient, the faster we can make that, the better. Now, it's not always going to be accessible off the gate, right? I mentioned the Porsche Taycan. Obviously, that's a very expensive vehicle. This demonstrating vehicle, the Polestar 5, is expected to come in above $100,000. Also, not a cheap car. But it is very tantalizing for Nancy to think, okay, 2027, Polestar 5 comes out, maybe within two or three years, by 2030, we'll have like Chevy Bolt style cars that can have this technology. Yeah, I mean, it, totally. I can't, this is really cool to watch this unfold because in my opinion, this technology is going to come along. It has to come along. And I'm excited to be alive to watch it happen. I'm not exactly sure exactly how it's going to unfold or who's going to do it first. So to be able to see what kind of experimentation or real life testing is happening and what the results are is really exciting. So one thing I do want to talk about is StoreDots, the XFC technology, so of this battery. And this battery, it utilizes a silicon dominant cell or silicon dominant cells with energy, energy density on par, they say, with NMC cells. And these are the lithium ion batteries, cells that use a combination of nickel, manganese, and cobalt as the cathode, cathode cells, excuse me. And these are pretty common, the NMC batteries and cells that we see. But differently, this technology in the store dot battery in this prototype Polestar 5 battery doesn't require the specialist cooling systems like you mentioned in the vehicle. And maybe if you're not a super EV nerd, you're not really sure why that's significant. You know, it's probably important, you know, batteries heat up when they're charging, uh, cooling should happen. But it's, they say that this experimental batteries modules have a also structural function that improves their mechanical properties and cooling ability while maintaining or reducing the weight level. So it does seem like this is something significant to take away. Okay, we don't have to put as much energy into cooling, right? What do you think about this, Max? Yeah, it's a lot to break down, but it's all really exciting stuff. And I'll put it into context as you know another EV owner. And I'm sure you can also speak of this, of course, with your fast. But uh, a lot of people who don't have EVs don't understand. EVs do get hot. 
they need cooling, right? And there's this myth that like, oh, EVs don't need grills or any kind of radiators or any thermal management because they're electric. They don't get hot. No, they still get hot. Uh, maybe not as hot as a gasoline engine when they're running on the highway, but especially when they're charging, they can. And even just driving, I will tell you at speeds, maybe I shouldn't disclose here, driving in the Rocky Mountains on I-70, high regen, high power, up hills. Like I, my car gets hot. I will get out of my car and I can hear the fans going for like 15, 20 minutes after I park it. Now granted, that's very hardcore driving, but that can happen with these EVs, especially if someone's doing that back to back, let's say driving through the Sierras in California on a road trip, fast charging, day, uh, you know, time after time, multiple times in a day. Uh, so this is really hard on the vehicle, it's really hard on the batteries because the batteries have to be thermally managed. But if a battery gets too hot, if it gets too cold, then your vehicle will have limited range, maybe limited performance. If you do that too many times, for too many cycles, you're actually potentially degrading your battery and losing uh, range and usable battery permanently over the long-term life of your vehicle. So it's really nothing trivial. And it's kind of a miracle, even the existing systems in vehicles right now that are always babysitting your battery, making sure it's at the right temperature. They're doing a lot of work for that. Um, so you know, what, what they mean no special cooling, I assume what they mean is they're still using a liquid cooling loop, just like almost every modern EV uses, but nothing super exotic, nothing super crazy, no like vapor chamber arrays or whatever. I don't know about battery engineering, but <laughs> presumably, you know, like technology that, you know, has been proven on the market. Um, so that's exciting to hear. So from a cooling and thermal standpoint, that's cool. Now, there's so many other dimensions to the thermal performance of batteries that they didn't disclose. Uh, we don't know. You know, this is a collaboration with a lot of players, right? It's Polestar with the vehicle, it's StoreDot with the battery and the charging technology, and Silicon Dominant Chemistry. I believe they're sourcing that from Group 14, who is a group who's kind of pioneered this former battery chemistry, and I guess is providing at least the cell level of these batteries. Um, so it's a lot of players working together for exciting technology, but you know, how will it perform in extreme heat? How will it perform in really extreme cold with winter? How will it be integrated into the vehicle for so that the vehicle can do smart things like precondition the battery so that your battery is nice and toasty when you leave off your home charger or that it's nice and at the right temperature, cool or warm enough for your fast charger so that you get that advertised charging speed. Because if you don't have the battery at the right temperature, then the behavior can be unpredictable and all over the place. So it's really like it's, you know, is like it's crazy. A difference of five degrees Celsius can make all the difference with modern EV batteries with how they perform. So they really have to uh, be at the right temperature. And then what you mentioned, Francie, the structural component is another dimension of battery performance. How much, uh, you know, how many kilowatt hours, how much energy are you getting per kilogram of mass? That's a big stat in batteries. They didn't disclose this, but presumably, you know, it's something uh, in the range of normalcy. If it's a 78 kilowatt hour battery, to me, that feels a bit small for like a high performance four door vehicle like the Polestar 5. I know they said they could expand to 100 kilowatt hours. It's suspect that they didn't do that for this test. Of course, they're testing it still, but hopefully when this vehicle hits production, I think consumers for all of the range and performance expectations we have, will probably expect a 100 kilowatt hour battery or even slightly larger for a vehicle of this class. Um, so, you know, the battery's gonna be big, it's gonna be thermally performant, it's gonna be volumetrically and gravimetrically efficient so that you don't have this huge, massive, heavy battery that ruins, you know, the handling and efficiency and all that of your car. Um, so there's, you know, batteries just have to, uh, perform in so many areas and so often in the industry the story has kind of been one step forward two steps back where a startup will announce some really promising technology oh my gosh this battery charges really impressively or it gets tons of range but then the deep dirty secret is maybe it has a really short lifespan and can only last 200 cycles or maybe it's really expensive to produce you know there's so many details that we have to see before production so i just want to be the nerd in the room and temper everyone's expectations to say this is impressive it's really cool it's you know the closest to production we've probably seen a version of the technology come but um you know polestar 5 is not even supposed to be here until model year 2027 and we have a long way to production still definitely and they didn't necessarily confirm either that this would be the technology in the final polestar 5s right this is all prototype this is testing so like you yeah. said until it's right in front of us, we're not really sure exactly what's going to happen. But of course, it's really cool to see 
these kind of experiments and this testing and these results. And it makes me think about, of course, the larger implications for this kind of innovation going from 10 to 80% state of charge in 10 minutes on, you know, extra fast DC fast charger, essentially getting a consistent high rate of kilowatts coming into your EV. And then even towards the end, they said they got like up to 370 kilowatts. I mean, just really yeah. impressive. So what do you think are the larger ramifications for this kind of technology innovation? Uh, well, it's exciting. And, you know, those numbers you gave, Francie, 310, uh, you know, averaging above that to peaks of 370, that's really cool. It's not unprecedented. We've actually seen that vehicles like the Silverado 4WT and the Hummer EV will do it. However, yeah. the reason they can do it is because they have lots and lots of cells in parallel uh, because they are big, big boy batteries. So I guess part of the excitement here is seeing this in a more pedestrian sized battery. The idea being that, you know, one day we can have uh, economy cars or just normal sedans or normal small crossovers, whatever the vehicle is, with a 60, 70, you know, kilowatt hour battery of this size that charges this well, that doesn't have to be massive, that can make the vehicle lighter and cheaper to produce. Of course, we don't know anything about this battery's minerals and how much those cost, but if it's comparable to uh, you know, the rest of the industry, then obviously, right, this is a huge step forward technologically. Um, I will say StoreDot, I just did some brief research on them before this episode. They've been, they were like, they've been around, I think, for over a decade. They were in stealth mode for a while. In the last three years, have been more public. I think last year was when they announced their Polestar partnership. Um, so, you know, it's exciting. They've clearly been researching this stuff for a while, but the path to market and the path to actually shipping this vehicle is, um, you know, going to be a big benchmark here. Once we see it in Polestar 5, I presume, you know, other OEMs will definitely want to like have their eyebrows raised and be like, okay, should we try to license StoreDot's technology? Should we try to develop our own version of it? You know, is silicon dominant batteries, are these going to become the new norm? Uh, I think this is like a pouch format cell, but like, can this be applied to prismatic and cylindrical and all the ways different vehicle manufacturers will want to arrange their cells and modules and battery packs. How is that all going to work? I don't know. But I'm really excited with this demo that they showed off today. And uh, yeah, it's promising for sure. Definitely. I, I do think it's promising and I'd love to see. I mean, I can imagine how this would change not only the industry and other automakers and what technology they adopt, but the adoption of EVs largely as well. I mean, with that price point, not so much, but of course, bringing that down. Also easier charging for people who rely on DC fast charging, whether they're driving cross country or to grandma's house, or they just don't have a charger at home, which is actually the case for a lot of people, including this gal right here. And the infrastructure now can meet those high demands that you were talking about that the Hummer and the Silverado can hit. You know, we're getting this stronger and stronger infrastructure, hopefully more and more reliable as well and more prevalent throughout our roads. The other questions that I have is about the cost of these batteries specifically. They didn't have any details on that. And then the scalability. Is it really feasible to scale this? We don't know anything about the standards of production or personally, I don't know about the standards of productions for this kind of battery, but we did reach out to Polestar and StoreDot teams to see if they can offer us a representative to come onto the podcast and enlighten us. And they are looking into it. So we are actively working on that. I think it's pretty cool. Love to see this kind of technology coming along and at least being tested. Of course, we'll have to see, like we said, what really comes next with this. Any final thoughts on this story, Max? Um, I just want to conclude that, you know, not only am I excited for the promising battery technology we've seen here, of course, Polestar is not the only automaker that's partnered with battery startups, you know, GM's Ultium technology relies on a lot of acquired intellectual property and other promising partnerships. There's all kinds of cool battery developments in the industry. There's so many going on in China. Uh, but to see Polestar as a brand walking on its two feet now and, you know, making these big steps, making these cool announcements, leading the charge technologically, it's really exciting because, you know, my Polestar too, I drive it, I love the car, but it was not exactly like tour de force of efficiency or technological leadership when it came out. It wasn't like a Toyota BZ4X, it wasn't embarrassing, it's just very like middle of the road. So <laughs> I think the path for a brand like Polestar, who aspires to be a performance, you know, luxury brand, they're only going more upmarket from here, is 
they're going to have to have some, you know, game changing differentiators. They're going to have to have performance, faster charging, uh, you know, the zero to 60 times we all love to talk about, maybe really good at, um, assistive driving systems, uh, since that's all the rage too, with a bunch of, you know, people who like to trade stocks on Twitter. So all that stuff's really important. And I just can't wait to see what happens with Polestar and of course, the rest of this industry to follow. And I hope, Francie, that you can get someone from Polestar or Store.on to talk about their tech, because I'd love to hear more about it. Me too. Yes. Thank you, Max. I echo a lot of your sentiments there and look forward to learning more about this as this part of the industry progresses. I think we can all benefit, of course. Let us know what you think about the story in the comments, what questions you have about this technology, what you might know. Do you own a Polestar? How would this change your life to be able to charge 10 to 80% in 10 minutes extra fast charging? Thanks for plugging in with us today on another episode of the Out of Spec Podcast. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.